Good afternoon. My name is Preston Sprankle. I'm an associate professor of urology at the Yale University School of Medicine. I'm also the vice chair of the NCCN Early Detection of Prostate Cancer Guideline Committee. And today I'm going to talk about some of the updates and changes between 2022 and 2023 guidelines. Uh, given the limited time, I'm pretty much just going to focus on the changes. So why prostate cancer early detection? Why is there a guideline for this? Well, the, the detection and screening and evaluation for prostate cancer is a large task that is very different from the management of diagnosed prostate cancer. And the goal of the early detection panel is to really help stratify prostate cancer risk and recognize that prostate cancer is a spectrum of disease and that early detection is meant to allow us to treat the most aggressive types of prostate cancer while avoiding overdetection and overtreatment. And so this is for men who have had shared decision-making and have opted into prostate cancer screening. This is the schematic for PROST-D1. This is the initial page um, looking at the characteristics of a baseline evaluation, the risk assessment, and then based on that risk assessment, what that early detection evaluation uh, would consist of. There were several changes uh, on this version. Um, we decreased the significance of the digital rectal examination and initial evaluation. We modified some of the age group based recommendations for PSA evaluation and overall evaluation. We acknowledge the increasing role of genetics and ancestry and role of the genetics counselor. Um, we strengthened the language supporting the use of prostate MRI prior to biopsy. We did backtrack a little bit regarding the language of, about infection risk with, associated with transperineal prostate biopsy, and then also some clarifying statements on the management recommendations for atypia and introductal pathology if detected on biopsy. So first off, looking at DRE and age group recommendations. So the main thing is for a digital rectal examination, previously the word strongly consider baseline DRE was in the text. Um, this was removed from the schematic and really just to consider baseline DRE. And that's because there's growing evidence that uh, digital rectal examination, especially by itself, adds very little to prostate cancer detection. Looking at some of the evaluation strategies, really one of the things was determining and stating that who is high risk. So on the previous 2022, we had average risk patients and then implied that age 40 to 75 were high risk. We clarified that with the language and just said that these are men with high risk and then gave those factors, black, African-American individuals, those with germline mutations that increase the risk for prostate cancer, and those with a suspicious family history. And we will talk about these in more detail. Also then in the detailed evaluation, um, average risk versus high risk. So patients with an average risk in PSA less than one had, can really limit or decrease the testing interval for prostate cancer. Whereas those with a high risk in PSA less than three, so this now includes men who have a PSA less than one, but who are high risk, more frequent testing is recommended. And similarly for those with an average risk and a mildly elevated PSA of one to three, um, repeat testing uh, is probably is indicated. Looking further at the bottom for the men aged greater than 75, really this remains a cohort of men that are very select, healthy, with a biological life expectancy that still remains at least 10 to 15 years. In these men with a PSA of less than four, repeat testing at one to two year intervals uh, is recommended. And this is different than previous when it was one to four year intervals. This is really meant to capture those men who could potentially have a more significant prostate cancer as we are recognizing there is an increased incidence of high grade and high risk prostate cancer in older men. So in summary, we were moved strongly from the language regarding DRE and mo modified the age group recommendations to include high risk and average risk and also shorten the screening interval in older healthy men. Looking at the role of genetics and ancestry, we're gonna dive into some of the footnotes here. <clears throat> you, previously there was one footnote, now there are three. This has really been broken out to give much more detail and specifically to note what is a family cancer history. Um, and it includes, but is not limited to, a first or second degree relative with metastatic prostate cancer or ovarian cancer, uh, a breast cancer in a relative assigned male at birth, or a breast cancer diagnosed in a relative assigned female at birth at age less than or equal to 45 years, colorectal or endometrial cancer at 50 years or younger, the pancreatic cancer, 
or two or more first or second degree relatives with breast, clinically significant prostate, colorectal, or endometrial cancer at any age. And patients with a suspicious family history should undergo genetic counseling and testing. Footnote B revolves around getting genetics professionals involved. If there's a known or suspected, as from the previous page, cancer susceptibility gene, referral to a cancer genetics professional is recommended for counseling and discussion of relevant testing. They may have an elevated lifetime risk of prostate cancer. In the case of certain gene mutations, an elevated risk of early onset or potentially lethal prostate cancer, for example, with BRCA2. We list multiple of these mutations. Um, primarily, BRCA2 is the one that has the highest association with advanced disease. And for this reason, those who are BRCA2 carriers, screening is recommended to start at age 40. Um, although those with other germline mutations could consider screening starting at 40 years of age as well. And we recommend screening at intervals that are annual rather than every other year, independent of the PSA value. Finally, looking at germline testing and whether it is negative. If there's a family history that is suspicious, uh, we recommend using shared decision-making about more intensive screening or not. And this really reflects that not all mutations have been identified, and we do not know what familial risk factors could be involved in a higher risk of prostate cancer, or we have an incomplete understanding of that. Finally, uh, looking at Black and African-American risk, um, the guidelines committee wanted to strengthen the language surrounding their risk and such that individuals have a significantly higher incidence of prostate cancer, increased prostate cancer mortality and early age of diagnosis compared to white individuals. Um, and based on the available literature, it was it felt important to include the significantly higher risk. The rest of the text is the same as previous. So in terms of genetic and ancestry risk, we as the panel recommended genetic testing if there is a suspicious family history. We listed the currently known mutations that have an increased risk for prostate cancer. We recommended referral to a genetics counselor if there is suspicion or presence of any of these risk factors, and also acknowledged that the risk for black African-American individuals is significantly higher in terms of their risk of incidence and mortality from prostate cancer. So then looking at MRI and transperineal biopsies, so these later sections of PROS D3, the language or the word strongly was added to the guideline to really emphasize that MRI is very important. Looking at the then footnote O around truss guided biopsy visa that either a transrectal or transperineal approach with or without MRI targeting. This was modified from language that said it transpeat biopsy is associated with low risk of sepsis to it may be associated. And this is really based on more recent publications that question not that there isn't a lower incidence, but just how different is that incidence and is it significantly different? There are several clinical trials that are pending that should answer this question definitively. Finally, uh, I wanted to clarify some of the recommendations for atypia and intraductal pathology and how to interpret those. The main difference was that for intraductal carcinoma without invasive carcinoma, this should still be treated as cancer and should be managed as recommended in the prostate cancer and CCN guidelines. Conversely, for atypia that is suspicious for cancer, this really is not felt to actually be a cancer or at high risk for cancer um, and was now grouped with high-grade PIN and benign cancers in terms of the management. If there is no prior high-quality MRI versus if there was a high-quality MRI performed is the real distinction here. Um, if there was no prior MRI, using biomarkers or MRI would be important. And if atypia is present, considering a single repeat biopsy when a MRI was not previously performed at 12 to 24 months was recommended. If, however, a high-quality MRI has been performed, no additional biopsy is recommended unless there is some other factor that is prompting the physician to think there is a high suspicion of cancer. PSA and DRE at 12 to 24 month intervals. This was extended from previously six to 24 months. That early six month follow-up is no longer recommended. So in summary, changes from 2022 to 2023 include baseline DRE is optional. We modify the age group recommendations to include risk stratification and shorten the evaluation frequency for select older men. We acknowledge the increasing role of genetics and ancestry and the importance of genetic counselor involvement. Um, strengthened the recommendation for using prostate MRI prior to biopsy and questioned whether transperineal biopsy does actually confer an infection benefit, but acknowledging that it may. 
And finally, introductal pathology should be treated as cancer, while atypia should be treated as benign. Thank you very much.